A couple of weeks ago, I was in Utrecht in the Netherlands for the first ever PKM Summit. I have so much more to say on the topic because it was an amazing time. But in this video, I'm going to be re-giving one of two talks that I gave at that conference. The first talk I gave was about Excaladraw for tabletop role-playing games. I did that one with my friend Jolt Vitsian. He had a video a few days ago that came out and he talks a little bit about what we talked about in that presentation. So I thought I would give my one that I did on my own. This one is called Doing It in Public, Observability for PKM. Now I wanted to do this because this is going to be something that relates what I do for a living to what I do for fun, which is this YouTube channel and just general note taking <laughs> that I love to do. When I went to the PKM summit, I had just come, like literally just gotten off the train from Paris, a conference there um, was being held just before the PKM summit. This conference is called KubeCon and it's a conference about Kubernetes and observability and a bunch of other awesome things. So here I am with some of my coworkers at my company's booth. Now I'm telling you this because in this presentation, I kind of talked about what I do for a living and how it's related, I think, to PKM personal knowledge management systems. Now, what I do is that I am a little bit of kind of like an ethical hacker. I am a performance engineer, which means it is my job to make software systems more reliable, performant, scalable, basically just to increase their quality. And a lot of that involves trying to break it. I am the kind of person that is hired to break a system for ethical reasons. What I do is kind of similar to hacking, except that there is a fine line and that line is called consent. Companies hire me or people like me to find out all the ways that a system is going to fail and then try and fix it before it actually happens. So a lot of that is trying to find out the limits of a system. Now you might think that when I'm contracted, and I start with a new job, I might just start with increasing all of the things, making, making a machine, you know, twice as powerful, you know, give it more storage, more CPU, more memory, and all of the things. That is sometimes part of it, but actually what I usually start with is making the system observable. So observability in this context is being able to see what's going on inside a system. You see, usually when I come into a new project, it looks kind of like this. It's a black box. This is a problem and it is more of a problem when you're trying to improve it. Because how can you improve something when you don't even know what's in it? Often a lot of the teams that I am involved in only know their own little piece of the puzzle, and then it goes into the black box as far as they're concerned. They might roughly know what team is going to be handling that request or that transaction next, but they don't know the full story. So before I can even start to make something like this more resilient or more performant, I really have to remove the lid of that box. I really have to find a way to make its contents observable to everybody. Now, the weird thing about this is that I've found that sometimes the sheer act of making something observable is enough to cause some real changes. It's kind of like this idea from Seinfeld of not breaking the chain. It's a very simplistic way to track a habit. You pick a habit and every time that you do it, you cross physically something off of a calendar. You cross that day off. And the idea is that you don't want to break the chain. So you keep doing that habit. What initially was just for tracking or for observing becomes a sort of reward in itself because you don't want to break the chain. So you just keep doing the habit. So what was supposed to be just kind of a, a third party looking at whether or not you did the habit now becomes a source of motivation in itself. And this is also what I found to be true when I am working on making something observable. Sometimes 
just by saying like, hey, this is the state of the system right now, people already start to change their behaviors or work on different things just to make those things that are made observable a, a little bit better. So this could be like a number. It could be, you know, the the amount of the, the percentage of the CPU that is being used by an application. Making that number observable has this cool effect in the rest of the team where they now have a number to look at and almost unconsciously, they start to change how they behave to optimize that number. This is the magic of observability. So how can we apply it to PKM? Well, we're going to get into that in a second. But first, I want to talk about why you'd want to make your PKM system observable. The first part is accountability. Now, when when I talk about learning in public, um, I that that can mean so many different things, but it really is fundamentally making things observable. This has the benefit of increasing accountability. One of my favorite reasons to learn in public is that now if I if I say that I want to learn something, then people hold me to it <laughs> or, or, you know, not in a mean way, but they do tend to ask a little bit more like why, why I haven't done this or, or they, they just give me a lot more interaction that motivates me to keep learning or keep doing whatever it is. The second part is feedback. Putting something out there means that there's a lot more of a chance that you're going to get something back out. So lots of people might comment on it, but even if they don't, you know, one good comment or one, one person saying like, hey, did you consider this or this didn't really resonate with me? That's already more information that, that you would have gotten if you had not made it observable. So I love this idea of putting something out into the world because that increases the chances of you actually improving what it is that you're working on based on the signals that people give back to you. Another reason is visibility. Now, I have been in this industry for over 12 years, and I haven't had to apply for a job from scratch for like the last decade. And that's because when you have a history of learning in pub public and making observable what you know, then people find you. And having a visible portfolio of the things that you like, the things that you're interested in, is really a compelling reason for people to want to work with you. I have about 10,000 notes that are, are on in my vault. Maybe about 7,000 of them or so are public. And... They're not all correct, right? I wouldn't say that they're, you know, that they're masterpieces or anything. But there is one thing that people can't deny when they see that I have thousands of notes, especially around a certain topic like, you know, performance engineering or software development. And that is that I'm very, very interested in this topic and have spent a lot of time learning in this area. And that type of visibility is really difficult to deny. There's also clarity. Making something observable is also about getting clear on what it is, what it's about. You might think that you have a handle on a topic, but then you start to think it through and you start to try to explain it to someone. You're like, oh, I actually don't know why this is important. And for you know someone like me who who does tend to get stuck in these rabbit holes and then you, you know, I just I sometimes lose sight of, of the reason that I was even interested in this topic in the first place. It is very good to have that sort of North Star. When I make a video on something, it does force me to kind of think about what is actually the most important thing to say and not, and that's usually not every single detail about it. What's usually most important is why should, why, why should I do this? Why does it matter? And what is the thing in the simplest language possible? And observability really helps me with that because it holds me to the standard that other people are going to be holding me to as well. I also think that making things observable 
is just the sc most scalable way to do it. So just like in a system, you whenever you build a, an application that is going to be publicly facing, like publicly accessible online, you have to think about scalability. You have to be able to adapt if suddenly something goes viral or there's a sale and more people turn up and buy stuff or try to buy stuff than what you expected, you have to be able to increase the scale of it and meet that demand. Now, in the context of a PKM system, this could be just putting what most people call content. Now, I just, I like to think of it more as learning in public. And that's because if I thought of it as making content, I think I would just fall into imposter syndrome a lot. I know when I brought this up at the PKM Summit, lots of people resonated with this. And the reality is that it never goes away. And I think that it, more people would be making stuff online if we stopped thinking about, about having these polished, beautiful pieces of work that we send out into the world after years of, of toil and just thought of it as making learning observable. Now, I think that... There's a lot to be said for, you know, iterating on something, but why can't that be in public? Why can't the entire thing be observable rather than you just slaving away in a basement or something and not already getting feedback by working with the garage door up, as Andy Matushak says. So, okay, let's talk about how you would even make your PKM system observable. Now, there are four main things, and I'm relating this to how I would make a system observable. And I'm going to go over each one, so don't worry if you don't understand um, all of these right now. But in general, you would first make the thing, because you can't make anything observable if there's nothing to be made observable. You can instrument the thing by making it easy to find. You monitor the thing. This is how you get feedback, and also you refactor the thing. This is what you do with the feedback. You have to adapt it and change it and make it better. So making the thing. Now, a lot of people have a lot to say, but they don't know exactly how to express it. I think this is kind of the way that you can rephrase this or reframe it in your head is don't think about what other people want to get from you. Just start documenting. Gary Vaynerchuk has an, an awesome uh, kind of theme to his work, which is document, not create. And his idea is that uh, it, kind of along the same lines of the imposter syndrome, when people think of creating a video or writing a blog post, it just feels really daunting. But actually, everybody has a story and everyone has an interesting spin on things. And if they just documented what they're already doing, then they would find that lots of people already get value out of it. And in much the same way, the way that I would start with any sort of note taking or creating a PKM is by doing daily notes. So that's this first one here. I really love daily notes because everyone knows how to create a log about our day. It is just, this could just mean writing stuff down that you've done. It could be bullet points. It doesn't need to be a paragraph form. Then you can start to think about things that resonate with you. Now, this is sometimes referred to as having a resonance calendar, but what that means is when you see something cool, put it in your daily note or put it in some sort of note in your PKM system. This could be a video that you watched. You know, sometimes you might not even have to put a comment on it. Maybe you just put in the link and some, some sort of description of what it was about. It could be something that came up in conversation with somebody. So you could also talk about people you've met or meeting notes. And, and then really, you can just follow your passion. I think most people think that it has to be, you have to predetermine what you're going to talk about before you actually figure out what you're interested in. But I think that's the other way around. You start with what you're already doing. You start with what you're already passionate about. Because if you try to force it, I think it's going to be really obvious. And it's also not going to be very sustainable. So I tried to do this. I actually started this YouTube channel thinking it was going to be something else, happened to mention Obsidian, and my passion for it came through. 
And so I pivoted entirely to talk about Obsidian because it turns out when you're passionate about something, it shows and people like that. And then the other thing about, well, making the thing is that you need to make a habit out of it. Now, I know daily notes are, are daily, but you know, you don't really have to be that strict about it as long as you're building this habit of doing it kind of on an ongoing basis. And then I put a nice little helm here because in software development, there is a point where you've built something and you put it out there and you've, you know, tried to make it as good as you can, but you're just gonna have to ship it. You know, you really aren't going to get feedback until you decide, okay, code freeze now, which means you're not going to be working on it anymore. You're just gonna have to cut and run and, and just put it out there. And that is referred to as shipping it. So after making the thing, you're going to have to release it. Sometimes though, even though you've made the thing, you might need a little bit more of a push to actually ship it or to hold yourself to the things that you wanted to make. In this situation, what works for me is using pre-commitments. So this is a post that I put up on Mastodon, which is my social network of choice. I wanted to learn about facilitation. Now I could have just learned it on my own and that would have been fine, but I really like the accountability of making a pre-commitment. And making a pre-commitment means saying publicly what you're going to, what your learning process is going to look like and really saying, this is my intent. Now, I think that doing this in public increases the, the accountability factor for me. I totally understand if it's not for everybody, but it works for me. And here's how, here's one of the ways that I like to do it. So in this post, I talked about wanting to get better at facilitation. So these are the commitments that I made. In April, which actually is next week, like in a few days, <laughs> this is going to be happening. I signed up to, I volunteered for my, um, my company's conference. I'm going to run the unconference part. So I wanted to learn facilitation by then. And I kind of charted out a learning journey to get me to that point. So before then, I invited my friend Steve Upton, who's pretty good at facilitation. He, he came and talked to me on a live stream, which is already up. So I got to pick his brain about facilitation. And I also signed up for my other friend, Andy Polane's course. So Andy is like really good at facilitation. This is such a big part of his job and he has years of experience in doing this and leading workshops. So I signed up for his course and I've done that. And I also actually published my notes on it. And at the time of this post, I, I, this was like two months ago, I also read a book called Open Space Technology. Uh, what's cool about this is that I, well, as soon as I posted it, people commented on it saying like, hey, did you think about this? Or here's a resource that you might not have considered. And this is why it's so awesome to make pre-commitments. I was just tossing this thing out into the void saying, this is what I'm gonna do. But what I got back, because I made this observable, was a lot of really good information that was sort of incidental to my learning process, but which ended up really informing it in a really positive way. So the second part is instrumenting the thing. Instrumentation means making something findable. So think of it in terms of that black box of a software system. Instrumenting it would be putting something in the box that is recording what's happening. So in the context of a PKM system, I like to think of this as two things. One is making it findable for me. And then the other part is making it findable for others. Now on the finding it for me part, there are a few ways that I like to do this. And here are some of those methods. One is by searching for it. This is still the most common way that I do things. I use the quick switcher a lot in Obsidian. I also use properties. I have videos on, on using data view, still one of the most important plugins in my Obsidian workflow. I use links a lot. And by the way, this is in order of how much I use these things, but you know, there's no right way. 
you kind of should just gravitate to whatever you you think would work best for you. So I tend to make things that are link heavy. I like maps of content. I like having these hub notes that are links to other notes. And, and I really like to see that fleshed out depending on my interest in that topic. Folders are also something that I, okay, I admittedly don't do it that much, but other people like to organize and find things in this way. And then also tagging can, can be a great way to both search for and um, kind of have some sort of status. Actually, I had a friend, Jorge Arango, come on a live stream on this channel. I'm going to link that up there where he had some really great ideas about when to use tags and when actually you should use this, these different forms of finding things. And then there's also bookmarks. Bookmarks are a relatively new feature, the newest of all of these features actually. And they are, uh, for me, what I like to use them for is as a kind of current workspace of things that I'm working on right now. All of those nodes are in my bookmarks just for easy access. I think the golden standard in making something findable for myself is some sort of visual representation of it. Now, Obsidian does come with its own native graph view. I kind of prefer Excalibur just because it is a little bit more customized. Well, not a little bit. It's a lot more customizable. Jolt Vixian also makes that one. And he based it on this other app that I didn't actually use, but it's called The Brain, which is almost entirely visual if I understand it right. And a visual graph of your notes is really important because you start to take into account the spatial, the, the spatial element of your notes. Like, is this idea spatially close to another idea? Are they in opposition to each other? Are, do, does one strengthen the other? Those sort of ideas, I think, are or those sort of relationships are best explored visually. So I really like it from that perspective. Now we go to the external findability part of it, making something observable. So in software, if this would be like putting something inside the box or putting something inside a machine that is measuring some sort of output, then making it externally observable would be like putting it on a dashboard for other people to see. It would be like sending it to other teams and saying, hey, this is what my team's doing. And in the context of a PKM system, I think one of the easiest ways to do it, especially if you're using Obsidian, is by publishing your notes. This is my public Obsidian vault. I use Obsidian Publish, and I have a, a lot of my notes that you can just freely browse. I don't know why you would want to, but sometimes people do. Now, one of the key things for me is that I don't have a purpose for it. I don't say like, this is my vault for work, or this is my vault for Obsidian. I, I just follow my interests and I post whatever. So you can kind of see from the things that are posted here, like you see uh, this is a, a Dutch tax um, note alongside a tabletop role-playing one. I mean, these are uh, the river of blood. These are all gaming terms. And, uh, you know, 1.5 billion tests per day at Meta, that's a work note. But I don't really classify these notes as that. I do have some folders here, but for the most part, they're just kind of higgledy-piggledy. And I just rely on those other ways that I mentioned to find it, to find different notes. This is kind of like my stake in the ground <laughs> in, in the internet. And this is my way to expose what I've been thinking about. And especially when, when I'm talking about things that I might be particularly interested in, I really like the concept in software development of having a change log. When there's a new version of a bit of software, they release a change log with every, everything that, that has changed. I kind of borrow this and I create my own change log using the Vault change log plugin, which I have modified and forked. And this is just a list of the last 500 notes that I've touched that I am publishing. 
this is useful for telling people like these are the things that I've been doing that I've been researching and if nothing else it is a record of my interests if that is all a little bit too daunting and maybe you don't have notes to publish yet then I would suggest thinking of this awesome micro learning concept called TIL hashtag TIL stands for today I learned it's a lot less intimidating to do it because it's not a real it's not really a full note like you can see here this is a two sentence post on Mastodon on a social media network and what it is is just me saying hey I've been using obsidian for like three years now or something I just learned that you can actually use plausible with obsidian not too long ago you know and this has a benefit actually of making the place that you're posting in seem like a safer place for people to be like oh actually I didn't know everything that's an unintended benefit of it the real cool thing is that this is such a small way to expose a little bit of your process so if if you don't want to go through the effort of publishing your notes even publishing or making a small part of it exposed and observable and findable already creates like a ripple effect throughout the rest of your work the third part is monitoring the thing now i talked about making things externally externally observable monitoring it is not just making it observable but having the systems in place to be for it to be continuously observable so this is actually what my company does I, I work for a company called Grafana Labs and one of the major open source projects that that we create is something called Grafana which is a visualization and dashboarding tool it can pretty much take any sort of data and then visualize it the visualization part is really important kind of like how i was talking about the the visual graph for pkm earlier in software the, there's a tendency to just focus so much on on the data and there's a lot of it like there's everything in in tech is always producing data so you can get really lost in it monitoring it is not just exposing the data it's also expressing it to people in a way that can actually be understandable and a lot of times that is visually so this is something that can also be done with our pkm systems by literally pulling in numbers and putting it in some sort of graph but i also like to think of it in other ways for example you can think of monitoring as getting other people to do the monitoring for you and this can be kind of tricky right because maybe especially if you're just starting how do you get people to actually respond maybe you're putting something out there but how do you get something back i have a few tricks for that here's an example this is another mastodon post you'll see that mastodon is one of my favorite social networks for a reason and it's because i can do i can have these rich interactions with people that i use for my learning process now in this post I'm talking about somebody else's video. My friend Andy Pillane made an awesome video on defensive calendaring. I'll link to it up there. And I thought that it was a great opportunity to sort of highlight somebody else's work. I created a note on it. I actually updated two notes, this defensive calendaring one and productivity one, which I also put out there. And then I linked to the original video. And this is also a hashtag TIL, today I learned. So this is one great way to get others to observe you, observe them, you know, use your platform to shine a light on ideas that are worth sharing and participating in their learning process and naturally i've found that that comes back as well because when you participate in what they're doing they're much more likely to participate in what you're doing and then you create this kind of virtuous cycle where you're both learning from each other another cool way of how this can work but in reverse is this awesome sketch note that someone someone named elaine created based on one of the videos that i made isn't this awesome this is something that i never would have done for myself i'm not i'm not great at drawing i mean this is not just drawing but it's also you know the way that she visually represents everything i don't know that's just not one of my strengths 
And this is me being the one that someone else is interacting with. And because she made this effort to participate in what I was doing, I also promoted this and got to know her and, you know, she's an awesome person and now I'm promoting it to promoting her stuff to all of you as well. Because when you create good work like this and add value to the community, it's kind of impossible for that not to lead anywhere. And another thing that I've been talking about is using social networks. Now, I think that, I mean, unless you have like a full team or something, or you just have a lot of time, maybe this is your full-time job, um, it's going to be really difficult to do them all. There are so many social networks. I do not do this as a full-time job. Actually, I do this at nights and weekends. So I don't have the luxury of choosing all of the platforms. So instead, I've chosen two, my two favorite ones, the two ones that I feel like give me personally the most value. And that's Mastodon and Discord. The posts and the interactions that I was talking about don't exist in a vacuum. So you really have to go out of your way to join and participate in communities that are worth participating in. And I found that there weren't really enough communities that I felt were inclusive enough or, or, you know, talked about the things that I want to talk about in my specific overlap of interests. So I made my own and you can as well. So I chose Mastodon and Discord and I have free communities in both. Another way to get others to observe is by inviting them on your platforms and asking them all of the questions that you actually wanted to ask them under the guise of creating content, which is really just making your learning observable, remember. So I've been doing this for a few years now at work. Almost every week I do a live stream or a recording, a recorded interview with some of the industry's experts, like really people who know way more than I do about a particular topic. Here's an example of me wanting to learn about a project called Pyroscope. I really knew almost nothing about it. And despite having done some research, I still didn't quite get it. So instead of trying to push through it on my own or trying to ask people uh, about something that was very, very niche, I went straight straight to the founder. Ryan Perry is the original lead developer of this project. And I used my platform and my work for to, to be able to invite him onto the channel and talk to him about everything that he's doing. So I actually got a lot of really good information straight from the horse's mouth. And I came away with that from that experience with a, a lot more nuanced information about Pyroscope, stuff that you really only get when you can sit down with a person who's responsible for it all and you can say like, okay, really level with me here. What is this thing? Why did you make it? The funny thing is that because it's like under the guise of content, I don't know, it feels it feels less like me saying, hey, I'm such a noob at this. And it's just like, oh, I'm asking questions for the audience in case they don't know. So let's talk about Edward Bono's Six Thinking Hats. This is a great book. I really recommend it. His idea is that there are different hats that everyone on a team can wear at any given time. I like the idea that it is a hat because it's like a role that you put on. It is not you. It's not your personality. It's the role that you're taking right now. So you can think of this in my in my context. I think of this as the performance testing hats. So when I'm trying to make an application more performant, these are the different hats that I might wear. I want to particularly focus on the black hat, the hat of ritual descent. I find that descent is something that is very difficult actually to to maintain in our in our culture. It can be really really difficult for people to receive disagreements or criticisms about their work, but it is also really difficult to give constructive feedback. And yet you need that, right? All of this making things observable is not is not worth its salt if you're not getting some constructive feedback. If everything that you got was like, great job, that is useful in, from a motivation point of view, 
But actually, the most useful comments that I've gotten are ones where people have said, you know, you could have explained this better or you didn't even mention this part. And this is why I think it's important when we're talking about building communities to also think about giving out more freely these hats of ritual descent, making those communities a safe space for people to reach out and say, you know, this could have been done better. Now, the tricky part is that you should still encourage people to do this kindly and with compassion, right? But if you don't, if you aren't encouraging dissent in your communities or in your interactions with people, even if you don't own a community or if you're not part of a community yet, then I think you're missing out on a big part, a big reason for making things observable. Now, the last part is refactoring the thing. And refactoring really means in software development, updating and iterating code, but it specifically means not changing what the code does, not changing the core functionality of the code, but maybe changing things around it, like how it's structured or how, how exactly it's implemented. So I like to think of it as Lego. When you're making something with Lego, Never in that process do you think about changing what the Lego is made of or changing the shape of the block. You are just thinking of how to put things together using that block. And that still opens up a lot of possibilities. And I think it's the same with a PKM system. Our goal should be to create these modular bits of notes and thoughts and ideas and then remix them in interesting ways. Sometimes those other Lego blocks are gonna be your own notes, and sometimes they're gonna be other people's ideas. But the point is that after you get all of this feedback, after you've cultivated ritual descent, you need to be able to swallow your pride and actually modify the way that you're thinking and your notes and the stuff that you're putting out there to reflect those the learning that you've had as a result of making your notes observable. In software development, this graphic is called the CICD pipeline. This infinity symbol stands for continuous improvement and continuous deployment. Now, the idea really of this graphic is that software is never done. If you get to the point where you feel like something is done, then you're probably doing it wrong <laughs> because it's not just your job doesn't end when you put something out into production when people are actually using it. You're supposed to stay there and listen to that feedback, incorporate that feedback. And so here, even after it's deployed, you're still monitoring that and that should feed back into your next cycle. And that should feed back into the next thing that you're making. Now, I think that we should also think of notes in this way. They're never done. They're not blog posts. They're not like books that you've printed and are never going to update again. Part of the cool thing of having a digital PKM system is that you can afford to keep growing those ideas. So you can kind of think of this as a continuous note-taking process. Another thing to consider when you're refactoring the thing that you've made is that you should also be continually adding to adding to what you've made. So for example, this Obsidian for Beginners video that I made a couple of years ago did pretty well. And at that point, I, did, I wasn't sure. I thought maybe more advanced Obsidian videos were necessary, but it was actually the beginner part that did well. And so I released a few other videos on that, but I also wanted to distill my learnings um, and also expand on them. So this one was a th less than 14 minute video that eventually turned into my course, Obsidian for Everyone. And this is a four hour course now. So you can see that I went from, you know, what started as like uh, posts on Macedon, or I think I was using Twitter at the time. And then it turned into videos, which turned into more videos, which facilitated more conversation about how to use Obsidian, what it was, and I used all of that and funneled it into this course. So I like this idea of getting deeper into a topic as you go, rather than, you know, if I had started with a course right away, 
maybe I wouldn't have done too good a job because I would have made a completely different course. I would have made an advanced Obsidian user course because I didn't know that most people actually want the basics. That's really useful information to know and only information that I got because I tried things out. I tested the waters with also an easier lift of a 14 minute video. And when we were talking about continuous note taking earlier, another thing that I try to exploit when I'm refactoring my notes is the overlaps between different interests. So I talked about continuous note taking in the context of PKM, but I said that that is originally a software development concept. I mean, that is already a concept that I know, so I thought it was cool to be able to apply that to PKM. And then this one actually went the opposite way. I first heard about, or, or I first got into um, researching emergence when I joined Jolt Vixen's visual thinking workshop. That whole workshop was based on us processing the book Emergence. And then, even though I was thinking of it in the context of PKM at the time, I then related it back to my work and I have actually done talks based on Emergent load testing, for example. This is also about making things sustainable. If I didn't exploit overlaps between different aspects of my life, then I would not be able to make as many things as I can now, and I would also not be having as much fun. And this is also a bit of a meta thing, <laughs> because this presentation is in itself an exploitation of an overlap that I saw between the, the observability in the software development sense and what that might mean for a PKM system. I think that this is also a great way to express your personality because only someone who has a foot in both worlds could have come up with this concept, right? So to summarize what I talked about here, here are a few ways to make your PKM system observable. First, you have to make the thing and maybe that means just reducing your own standards for quality until you can actually consistently make something, whether that's a daily note that you later build upon and start creating other notes out of, and then, or, or you, maybe that also just means following your passions rather than following a script. So I really like this bottom up emergent approach of creating things. The second is instrumenting the thing, making it findable for yourself, from a PKM perspective, that could be like using the right keywords or naming a note the way that you would actually search for it. And it also means making it findable for others by publishing it online. I showed you my Obsidian publish site, but there are lots of different ways to do it. Lots of site, static site generators. And even if you're not using Obsidian, there's probably a way to make what you're writing public. The third way is to monitor the thing. So it's not enough to just put something out there. You also have to listen to what comes back. Part of that is cultivating a ritual descent atmosphere and really becoming a safe place, uh, a safe person to give criticism to. And then after you get that feedback, whether it's criticism or whether it's praise, then number four is to refactor the thing. You have to adapt your notes and allow them to evolve as your ideas and your knowledge evolves as well. So part of this is all feeding back into my book. So you can see I'm trying out some of the same concepts because I, I mentioned in one of my videos, I think, how, how I feel about learning in public, which turned into more videos, which turned into Macedon posts and discussions, turned into this presentation. But it's also, hopefully soon, I'm not sure, going to be a book. It's going to be called Doing It in Public. You can check out the book here. I already have an outline, but that's likely to change. It still changes very frequently. And you can also read some of the chapters already. 
And this is in addition to many of these topics already actually being in my public notes. That's also one of the cool things. Once you've made those Lego blocks, then it's just a matter of putting them together. So even though it looks like I have a long way to go, I've actually already written a lot of the stuff that I want to talk about. Or if not written, then I made videos on it or I've discussed it with people or they're in my personal notes. The whole point of being able to do it in public and making things observable is that you never start from scratch. And that makes it an easier lift to make stuff in the first place. So here are some links to various things I've mentioned. You can feel free to pause the video here and you can also go to this link to see these slides because I've also made this slide deck observable. The PKM Summit was really an amazing experience. I got to meet a lot of really cool people that I, some of whom I've been corresponding with online for years. And I also was exposed to a lot of different ways to think about PKM and note taking in general. I would really recommend that anyone who's at all interested in anything that I've mentioned here or in, in anything that I talk about in my channel, check out the PKM Summit site. I'm not actually affiliated at all other than that I spoke there, but you can check out the link here. They are going to have another one next year, also in Utrecht in March, but they're also going to have another one in April in the US. So if you're at all interested in that, go buy tickets or apply to speak when, when they're ready for that. I really recommend it. Thanks for watching. I hope that this has encouraged you to make some of your learning a little bit more observable.